What's up, everybody? I started out to make a video about the Age of Exploration, and I thought, well, then I got to talk about this, and then I got to talk about that, and that's a three-hour video, so I got to break this down into little bites. So I'm not sure what bite this is going to end up being about, but it's all part of a bigger sandwich of history. So let's just start off with the timelines, because everywhere I look, there's a gap of 800 to 1,000 years. Or things just disappear for a thousand years and reappear on the other side for no apparent reason, like Gnosticism. This is a map from 10th to 15th century of how Gnosticism expanded to the west from modern-day Turkey and Greece, where you've got the Bogomils all the way over into Italy and France, where you've got the Cathars. And I've done a video about what happened to these Cathars due to the Roman Catholics. And they brag about the ruthless efficiency of them eliminating the Cathars. Now, here's the deal. Gnosticism was a big deal in the first couple centuries after Christ. And then ending in the third century, not to be seen again in any of this area until the Bogomilist expansion, 10th century. That's 700 years. So that's like the people of modern day Mexico who are predominantly Catholic, all of a sudden decide to revive the beliefs of the Toltecs who lived before the Aztecs. That's how big of a gap 700 years makes. And these were supposed to be lands controlled predominantly by the Holy Roman Empire. Also, Manichaeism, a guy named Mani over in Persia, was inspired by the vision of an angel in the 3rd century due to vicious attacks by both the Christian church and the Roman state. It disappeared almost entirely by the end of the 5th century and then sprung back up in the 14th century. So I've theorized for quite a while that they just added in time between 500 and 1300 AD. I want to explain this in a little bit of detail for the new people. If you've heard the shtick, then skip forward. But in 536 AD, that's just a date that historians have agreed upon, you have these cataclysmic events that we'll talk about in a second that wipe out a huge portion of society. And then in the 1300s, after an 800 year gap of no technological or philosophical progress, you have the Black D, which wipes out a huge portion of the population. But unlike the first time that happened, after this, you had the Renaissance, which was an explosion in art and culture and knowledge. So why didn't this happen after the catastrophes of 536 AD. They say power abhors a vacuum, which means if there's a position of power to be filled, someone will do it. And here's a perfect example of that. For some reason, the people of the Iberian Peninsula, modern day Spain, decided after 800 years of eating bland food ever since the fall of the Roman Empire, that now they want some spices from India. Now, this is something that modern day we take for granted to the nth degree. We're just used to having this stuff available at all times. But the spice trade made people incredibly multinational corporation wealthy. And this is what a scholar will tell you about the spice trade of the 15th century. There's an insatiable demand in Europe for luxury goods such as fine silks, clothes, dyes, spices, food, sugars, and things like that. There's a desperate attempt to discover new trade routes in order to secure that economy. This is where I got to jump around some, but you'll understand why the people of Spain took off sailing in the first place. And Portugal, who was a big player at the time. The story of Constantinople is completely underrepresented in YouTube historicities. <laughs> it's kind of the key to understanding the, the time gap. They say in 330 AD, Emperor Constantine moved the capital of Rome to Constantinople. And by all accounts, ancient Constantinople was every bit as rich and beautiful and cultured as Rome ever was. Here you can see the huge circus in the middle of town. I'm sure that's not quite the scale. But I was just reading something about the blues and the greens, which were different charioteer teams. It's also world-renowned for its defenses. You can see that it juts out on a peninsula. So they built massive walls along the western edge 
And as long as you control the waters around there, then it's pretty easy to defend. This was a major feat of engineering. They had a moat, then outer and inner walls with towers, and they even had a spot to grow your garden right next to the moat. And they say that Constantine moved his empire over here, and it somehow survived the conditions that caused the Western Empire to fall, and the Roman Empire continued on really quietly up until the 1400s. So first, there never was a Byzantine Empire. There's nobody that called themselves Byzantines. They did call themselves Romans. And technically, the fall of the Roman Empire was 1453 Constantinople. This is where Christianity lost control of this region, and this is a very important region. Generally, whoever controlled Constantinople up here also controlled the eastern Mediterranean. And this is a key choke point to trade goods coming from east to west. China has been a powerhouse of industry ever since ancient times. The production of silk was literally a state secret back in the day. And then, like I said earlier, spices and all that from India. Everything has to pass through right here. From ancient times all the way up until the 1900s, you had the camel caravan routes. But you also had international shipping, all the ocean routes. They'd go up the Red Sea and, according to this, overland a little ways to the Nile and then up into the Mediterranean. So somehow the Western world collapsed, but the Silk Road continued on just fine international trade was fine until the 1400s i guess camel trains was a good investment because the umayyad caliphate controlled the whole southern route up till 750 a.d and after them was the abbasid caliphate up until the 1200s these are both muslim caliphates now i thought for the longest time that the motivation for adding in all of the extra time was the habsburgs legitimizing their rule as Holy Roman Emperor. After the catastrophes of the 14th century, they made up the character of Charlemagne and used that to claim they're of a royal bloodline. And I think they just based this great king off of King Solomon. Solomon, Charlemagne. I should do a video about that because they have a lot of similarities, like both being womanizers and both having special rings what I'm slowly starting to realize is they didn't just add in all of this time to legitimize the crown. They added it to legitimize Christianity itself. Because by the 15th century, the whole world was basically split up between Muslims and Christians. And look who controls the Eastern Mediterranean. This lasted all the way up until World War I, which is why I think it's so hard to find information on this period of Islam because the Western world plays for Team Christianity. For 500 years, from 1453 to 1900, Constantinople was Istanbul under Islamic rule. But the Pope and Rome says, no, these were Christian emperors for a thousand years. I seriously watched a three-hour documentary on the Byzantine Empire, and at two hours, 30 minutes, they were still talking about Justinian. There's hardly any Christian artifacts found there. The best known art that they produced in a thousand years is this 10th century mosaic of the Virgin Mary in the Hagia Sophia. And here's the deal with the Hagia Sophia. Every other cathedral of Roman Christianity is built in the shape of a cross, and the Hagia Sophia is completely different. This was supposedly built around 500 AD, right around the time the Church of Rome vigorously attacked and annihilated Gnosticism. In Gnosticism, they believe in the mother goddess, whose name is Sophia. So the Roman Byzantine Christians decided to name their most important temple after the pagan goddess of a rival sect that they had just annihilated. That really doesn't make sense. Also, you see how Sophia is standing on the crescent moon. Well, you find this repeated over and over again in Christian art. They say this is meant to represent Mary's miraculous conception, but I think it was some sneaky Gnostic painters during the Renaissance that started this tradition based off of Sophia. They say the population of Constantinople was booming up until the 1300s in the Black D. I mean, come on, 26 million? Do we even have a city with 26 million people today? But a sharp decline in the population in the 1300s. Now let's look at this without the 800,000 years added in. 
let's say Rome in 300 AD is the same as Rome 1300 AD. So this is just 700 years ago, and this happens. In this book I've shown before where we've got record of all these places being destroyed, and it looks like they just slapped dates on these things where similar things happen at completely different times. God sent several judgments on Rome. First was rain, which fell from September and October. So a couple, three months of incessant rain, and the Tiber swelled so high it it drowned all the fields. It even overflowed the high city walls, which these are the ancient walls of Rome. So we're talking massive amounts of water. And after the rain ceased, the fields were just covered in slime and mud everywhere. This destroyed many stately buildings and ancient monuments. The granaries, food supply was destroyed too. Now, when they say many stately buildings and ancient monuments, this is what they're talking about. All this got destroyed by flood. So, do you think maybe that was the reason that they moved the capital over to Constantinople, but just because it was in such disrepair and ruin that it was just easier to move? Now, this book that was written in 1749, a little while before they had the official narrative put together, says that this destruction of Rome happened in 580 AD, where now official history says that Rome slowly declined from 300 to 580 AD, right at the same time. And then, wouldn't you know it, the the Pope took control. And it was supposedly Constantine that moved the capital over to Constantinople, but I got problems with anything Constantine-related because the church got busted for forging a bunch of documents saying that Constantine had ceded imperial power over to the Pope. Now, the way I see all this going down, let's just say that that happened in Rome in 1300. They moved their capital over to Constantinople and managed to cling on a few more generations of old school Romans. And then they were conquered by the Ottomans in 1453. This 1749 book says 381 AD, Constantinople suffered much by a great earthquake. 57 of its late built towers on the walls were thrown down. There was a tsunami and swallowed up many ships and several fine islands. After that was great famine and contagion. But key points here, 381 AD, 57 of its towers were thrown down. Now our official history says, yeah, there was a big quake in 447 AD when the fabled walls were still young and relatively new. So both accounts say that the walls were new, only we got a hundred years difference here. Then a thousand years of uneventful Byzantine history goes by, and in 1509, Constantinople is basically wrecked by a quake. Here's a woodcut of the big comet, and the comets and the quakes just go together in all of these different accounts. And I just wonder how much these events actually played into the collapse of the Silk Road, because I could very easily see Constantinople in a weakened state when it was taken over by Muslim rule. Ultimately, though, the fall of Constantinople, for whatever reason it fell, whether by military might or catastrophe, gave birth to the age of exploration in our modern world. The ancient Silk Road routes that evidently lasted for a thousand years through the Byzantine Empire plus seven, eight hundred years through the Roman and Greek Empires all of a sudden came to a halt because the Middle East was now under Islam rule and they cut off the Western Empire from trade goods from the Far East. This prompted people to risk life, limb, and ship to go down around Africa and the Cape of Good Hope, which is a very dangerous passage. But anybody that can find an alternate route to those yummy spice islands is going to be really rich. So I feel like I was kind of all over the place with that, but I wanted to do a little primer before the Age of Discovery and show that Constantinople was kind of the linchpin here in history. Because from 500 to 1300 AD, there's basically nothing going on in the Western Empire. Meanwhile, this is the golden age of the Byzantine Empire in the East, but they really don't have anything to show for that thousand years. The term Byzantine itself means very complicated, hard to understand, secretive. 
I hear lecturers all the time say information on that is Byzantine, meaning that it basically doesn't exist. There's hardly any of it. But supposedly they made it a thousand years where other empires are lucky to last for three or four hundred. And since it fell into Muslim hands for 500 years, who's to say it wasn't Christian for a thousand years before? I was wanting to get in the timeline a little bit more, but it's kind of a complicated knot to untie here. But hopefully I explained it well enough that you kind of see where I'm coming from with this. At this time, the world was being divided up between Muslim and Christian. And that's why you see such an aggressive push by all of the Roman catholics to convert the peoples of new lands to Christianity. And we'll get into that at another time. Static out.